Good morning. Are we awake? It's a, it's 11. We're awake now. I love second service. Not that I don't love first service. Don't tell them I said that, but i um, super excited to be with you this morning. Um, where Julie talked last week about the confusion around who the Holy Spirit is as the revealer. Today, we're going to be looking at the controversy of what the Holy Spirit does as the empowerer. Empowerer, it's kind of a little bit of a tongue twister. But I'm excited this morning, and I understand that controversy is a weird word to describe a member of the Trinity. I understand that. Like, you know, there's a hundred other words we could describe that. But truthfully, for many of the world, they're kind of like comfortable with the idea of God. They might not know who God is um, or even believe in him, but it's like, yeah, God, a higher power. And Jesus, you know, for the most part, people like Jesus, he's cool. He's got a beard and hair, right? We assume. Um, people can get down with Jesus, but the Holy Spirit, like, <laughs> that's either like spooky or kooky or like a little bit of both, Right? You might have had an experience with one of these extremes, right? You're like, please, Lord, why did I invite my friends this Sunday? Like any other Sunday, why this Sunday? I can feel it in the room right now too. But truthfully, when it comes to the Holy Spirit and more specifically, his role as the empowerer, it is important for us to look at why the controversy? Why did he have to come and move in power? Why do we see people speaking in tongues or all these other manifestations of his spirit? Why, why? Could we have done it like in a more simple, like more explainable, more palatable way? Truthfully, I think one of the biggest misconceptions in our life is that true maturity is independence. I can do anything by myself, right? It's a whole movement, do you? You're powerful. The reality is, guys, that apart from the Holy Spirit as the empower, whatever we gain in our own power, we have to sustain in our own power. I'll say it again. Whatever you gain in your own power, you have to sustain in your own power. How many of you have tried to sustain your marriage in your own power? How about those little tiny people you're in charge of? You ever try sustaining in your own power with them? How about your work, school, your business? Whatever you gain in your own power, you have to sustain in your own power. The Holy Spirit being the empower is key. Because when we talk about this power, we're not talking about some mystical, like spooky situation where you're talking about a person. I love this quote from a Randy Clark book. It says, the Holy Spirit is not a doctrine to be studied. He is a person to be experienced in power. The Holy Spirit is not a doctrine to be studied. He's a person to be experienced in power. This is the same power that Jesus himself, before he entered ministry, He said, I waited to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This power is the same power that then he instructed his disciples, don't move. Don't do anything until you're clothed with this power. And I believe this morning, this 11 o'clock service, I believe that there is a fresh, there is a fresh invitation to receive the Holy Spirit as the empower to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you guys excited? Are you ready? All right, we're gonna pray. Yeah, Holy Spirit. Not like you aren't already in the room, but we even more just say, come. Come and do what only you can do. Come fill us afresh this morning. Come stir in us. Come move. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here with us. We just take a second and we wait on you. Yeah, we don't want to do this morning without you. We don't want to talk about you like you're not in the room. We we want you here. Holy Spirit, we say come. In Jesus' name, amen.
Can you feel? Can you feel that? Yeah. It's going to be good, and I'm going to not cry, okay? Y'all, I'm saying that out loud so that you can keep me accountable. Okay. That's true. Crying is great, but it's hard to talk when you're crying. <laughs> like, truly, if I, wasn't, if I wasn't talking, I would cry, but when you're talk crying, you know, it's just not, it's not the move. Um, I'm going to define a couple things before we get started. Um, first is the word empower. Now, empower, that's such a hard word. I don't know why I'm struggling with it. Um, empower simply means to give someone the authority or power to do something. I'll read it again. To give someone the authority or power to do something. I want us to keep that in mind as we talk about Holy Spirit, the empower. To give authority or power to do something. Another word we're going to look at, oftentimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit, uh, we definitely talk about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Now, manifestation means clear appearance, which is kind of a laughable definition. Because how many of you ever, please don't leave me out here by myself, uh, snot nose crying, maybe mascara dripping, like sobbing, anyone else, please, uh, as the Holy Spirit moves. And then afterwards, you're like, I've just never felt so much joy, right? You're sobbing, but you've never experienced so much joy. Or maybe, we're starting to talk about the weird ones, someone's shaking violently on the ground. You're like, wow, there's a lot going on there. Um, And then you talk to them later and they're like, I've never experienced so much peace. They're like, manifestation, a clear appearance, like that doesn't seem super clear. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit moves, there's laughing, there's running, shout out. There's, there's joy, there's laughter, there's people falling, there's people shaking. It, it's, it's a wild scene. And then other times, it's still. I've seen some wild things when the Holy Spirit moves. I myself have experienced some of those wild things. And then I've been in other rooms where it's thousands of people just sitting there waiting in silence. When the Holy Spirit moves, when God, the creator of the universe, a very supernatural God, encounters a very natural earth, the atmosphere changes. The environment changes. And your body responds. What I don't want to do this morning is to get lost in the manifestations. They're important. They they serve a purpose. But this morning, I want to talk about kind of why he does what he does, but also my goal this morning is not that you walk away being like, ah, yes, the Holy Spirit does that because of this, this. The reality is that theologians, people way, way smarter than me, have studied this for centuries. They they have spent the time, and, and they don't even know how to explain some of the things. My hope for you this morning is that you'd be provoked, that you'd be stirred, Maybe some of you have encountered the Holy Spirit before. I believe he wants to do it again. I believe like we talked about in a a series ago that there is more. There's always more. Right, Right when you get to the edge of the more you've experienced, surprise, there's more. And as I was preparing for this message, I just continually, Holy Spirit, thank you for not fitting in a box I can understand. Thank you for not fitting in a box that I can easily reason. Guys, I don't know about you, but I need a God that's greater than my thoughts. Like I need a God that's bigger than myself. I need him. I love you all. Some of you this morning, your God's not big enough. Your God is easily reasoned. It easily, nicely fits in the perfect little Sunday morning box that you've got. But when the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power, you cannot contain. You cannot contain. It can no longer stay in this like explainable, reasonable box. I believe this morning he wants to wreck some of you, like Di so eloquently talked about in her book, Wreck for God. I believe he wants to wreck us this morning. And I understand that these manifestations, these things we talked about, they're controversial. Speaking in tongues, headline, right? Like if we wanna get crazy, like I'm good, just don't do that. Like whatever that is, just don't do that. 
But the reality is these manifestations, they're unto something greater. They're unto something greater. And these manifestations have kind of had some two distinct viewpoints. The first being that although the Holy Spirit's position in the Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. His position in the Trinity has continued on, but his power, his manifestation of his power have ceased with the early church. This viewpoint is sensationism. And for us here at the Vineyard and as a movement, we believe that the Holy Spirit's position in the Trinity has continued, but also his power, his manifest power has also continued on. That term is simply continuationism. We love that it's like continues on, right? Now these terms, like I said, have been debated for centuries. So what we're not gonna do this morning is be able to properly articulate the complexities of the Holy Spirit in 30 minutes. That would be foolish of me, I know myself. What I hope is that we would have an encounter that's unexplainable, an encounter that changes your life. And that can only come when we realize maybe our God's not big enough. Maybe the view of God is not actually the full picture. And the beauty is we never see the full picture. You know, sometimes that could be looked at as like a negative, right? There's a verse in the Bible like we see in part, but there's so much joy in seeing in part. There's so much joy. There's so much joy in the journey knowing there's always more for me. That what I know, what I've comprehended to this point, God wants to even more exceed that. It's exciting. I wanna look at how Jesus encountered and talked about the Holy Spirit as the empower real quick. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna go to Luke 24. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a recap. Um, So Luke is one of the gospels. It's a book in the Bible. I would encourage you to go read the gospels. They're super good. And then while you're reading the gospels, I want you to flip all the way back to the beginning. And I just want you to start the whole Bible because it's all super, super good. It's a joke. It's a joke. But read your Bible. It's important. I think it's massive in your walk with Jesus. But we see in Luke 3, Jesus, the Son of God, gets baptized in water. Shout out water baptisms on the 30th. If you have not been baptized, this is a beautiful time to get baptized. Jesus himself is baptized. And as he's baptized, it says, the heavens parted and the Holy Spirit descended on him. And the Father spoke over him, this is my Son in who I'm well pleased. So then Jesus, now filled with the Holy Spirit in chapter four, goes out into the wilderness where he's tempted. Then he comes back, he picks 12 seemingly random guys and they go on three years of the most wild ministry that the world has ever seen. They saw power, people being healed, the dead raising, a happy meal multiplied. It was was something to see. Then Jesus willingly chose to die on the cross and, for, and once and for all, for all of mankind, swallowing up sin, shame, the grave, he took it all on that day. He died and then three days later, just like it was prophesied, he rose again. And then for the next 40 days, he spends time with none other than his boys. He spent time with his disciples. And right before he then ascends into heaven, this is the message that he leaves them. He reminds them of all that they have seen. And he said, you are witnesses, verse 49, of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. I love this. He's saying, remember all the things you've seen. Remember all the miracles. Remember all the power. Remember everything you've seen. Now stay here and wait. And let's be honest, waiting is very, very hard. Anybody else impatient? If you've ever had a baby, ooh, I just punched my mic. If you've ever had a baby, the last month of pregnancy is an absolute 1,000 years. Like you cannot talk me out of it. I understand the calendar is the same. It's 100 years. Thank you, ladies. How much, uh, what about the microwave? You know, those last six seconds, you're like, that's not needed. It's done. Like just pop that thing out, right? Waiting is hard. It's difficult, it's challenging. And I wanna lean in for a second. Sometimes I think we bypass waiting, we end up in our own timing. When we bypass waiting for the Lord, we end up moving in our own timing. And like we talked about earlier, anything you gain in your own power has to be sustained in your own power. He says, wait. 
So these disciples and 120 people go into this upper room and they sit there and wait. And I bet at this point, they're probably conditioned for like a three-day waiting period, right? They're like Amazon Prime, like they're ready. Like day I order, two days, we're here, right? Because Jesus just died and then three days later, he comes back. So they're probably all like, okay, third day is a good day for us to stop waiting, you know? They're up in the upper room for 10 days waiting on the Holy Spirit. And we see this pick up in Acts 2. If you didn't know, Luke wrote Acts as well. He got picked up for a second season. Don't we love that for Luke? He wrote the book of Luke and then the second season, it's Acts. So it's really important that we read the last part of the first letter as we go into this next part. Acts 2. And I'm sure you've heard this story before. If you've ever uh, heard of the Holy Spirit, I'm sure somebody's probably read Acts 2 to you. If not, if it's new, even better. But I want you, as I read this, if you have to close your eyes, I want you to close your eyes. This isn't like a Disney Plus, like a fairy tale movie. This was real reality. I want you to put yourself in that room as we read it. Acts 2.1. Then the day of Pentecost arrived and they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven the sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews and devout men from every nation under heaven And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered, each one of them hearing them speak in their own language. These are people from all over. They hear this sound and they gather together. And as they gather, they don't all speak the same language, but somehow they're hearing the gospel being preached in their own language. This was wild. This was unexplainable. And I love in verse 12, it says, And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others said mockingly, they filled with that new wine. (laughs) They're a little drunk. That's what he's saying. I don't know if that was the inflection of their voice, but they filled with that new wine. You know what I'm talking about? I love that Luke sets it up like this because I actually believe that this was the birthplace of supernatural ministry. It says that some were amazed and some were perplexed. That some understood what was going on. Some some were in awe, and, and some were not only confused, but they began mocking. He's holding these two things in tension. When the Spirit of God shows up, sometimes we understand it, sometimes we don't. These two things in tension are 100% the birthplace of supernatural ministry. There will be times where I understand what God is doing in the room. And there are other times where I'm like, I'm not sure. But what I do know when the spirit comes, the kingdom comes. And that's so important as we go into this next story. I believe that the infilling in Acts was yes, a personal, a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit. Each one of them, flames, fire on their head, wild. It was personal, but it was also unto something greater. It was bigger than themselves. I love this quote from Bill Johnson. It says, the Holy Spirit is in me for me, but he's upon me for you. I love that. He's in me for me, but he's upon me for you. And we see this played out in Acts 2, but we also see this played out in the early days of the vineyard. If you didn't know, Julie talked about last week, we are a part of a global movement of churches called the Vineyard. We're not the only crazy ones. We love that. We have other crazy relatives. It's so good. It's so good. And at the early stages of the Vineyard, it began to emerge around the 70s. And then one seemingly average Mother's Day, like what a safe invite, right? Like Mother's Day, for sure, gonna hand out some flowers, you know, like something like Mother's Day. The Holy Spirit comes in a wild manner. John Wimber, which was the vineyard's most defining leader, um, had this prompting from the Lord that he was supposed to actually not preach and he was supposed to let a younger guy named Lonnie Frisbee give a message. Now, Lonnie was a Jesus people person. So he's like a little crazy, like 
I would call it a little swirly, like just like not sure what's gonna happen. And John felt those same reservations, so much so that he extended worship. <laughs> like, we'll have you preach, but I'm gonna make worship very long, announced all the things. Um, and then he stayed at his keyboard the entire time, just in case something happened. And it was going really well. He was articulate, he was funny. You're like, oh, okay, he's doing great. So John begins to relax as ministry comes to a, end of his message comes to a close. And Lonnie Frisbee prays one of the most controversial prayers in our movement. He says, for so long the church has grieved the Holy Spirit. But he's getting over it. Oh. Then he began shouting, come Holy Spirit. And we're gonna watch John, I'm, I'm kind of like co-preaching with John Wimber, it's no big deal. Uh, we're gonna watch John uh, tell this story of what happens following this prayer. The first time that the Lord Jesus Christ sent his spirit in great power among us, I was fit to be tied for days. I was so angry. I was so upset. I wanted to get out of the ministry. I said, no way am I going to put up with Why, that's absurd what God did. <laughs> what was I worried about? This is great. You know, God, you're so good. And then he does the weirdest thing I've ever even heard of. <laughs> Everything's going good. You know, all of a sudden he stops and he says, well, that's it. He said, you know, the church has been offending the Holy Spirit a long time, and uh, he's, he's quenched, but he's getting over it. And we're going to invite him to come and minister. Now, come, Holy Spirit, and wham <laughs> The Spirit of God comes. And people start fighting. Well, first of all, he says, everybody 25 years and under, come forward. Well, in our church, that's everybody. You know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're all coming up there. And there's hundreds of them up all crowded around the stage. And he says, come, Holy Spirit. And the next thing I know, people are falling and bouncing in her and they're laying on the floor and they're talking like turkey. <laughs> and one kid, he falls. <laughs> one kid, he falls. And the microphone falls with him. You know, and it's laying right in front of his face. <laughs> and he's speaking in tongues, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about two minutes. I'm talking about 45 minutes he's talking through that microphone. And we're wading through bodies, you know, trying to get over to him. And we can't get the microphone off, and we can't get to him. And Lonnie is going like a banshee. You know, he's running through the crowd and raising his hands. And, you know, and I'm thinking he's pushing people over. He's knocking them down. But he's not even touching them. He's walking by them, and they're going wham, wham, you know, and falling everywhere. And I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, get me out of here. <laughs> well, over the next few weeks and months, the phenomena continued to occur, uh, often unrehearsed, often without any kind of leading from us. It would just happen in places. Uh, our young people began roaming the community in packs. We would see them sometimes in parking lots and in front of houses, raising their hands and praying for people, and wham, they would go. And over the, that was in May. By, the, by September, we had baptized over 700 new converts. Evangelism was occurring everywhere. That was not, those were the ones we baptized. The best we can figure, there may have been as many as 1,700 new converts in that three and a half month period. But the ones that we baptized, the ones that came toward us as, as, uh, and became involved in the fellowship, was approximately 700. God was on the move. I had never seen evangelism like that. I had never known that there was that kind of power. The problem was I didn't have any grid to sort it with. Nothing I've ever been taught in my educational background helped me to understand Holy Spirit come whammo and how that related to evangelism. How power and power signs and power activities could bring about conversion in the lives of individuals. What a powerful story. What a powerful story. Now we see him tell this and people are laughing. This is a couple years after, but in the, in the time, controversial. He even said himself, the pastor was like, I was angry. <laughs> I did not know if it was the Lord. Somebody ended up calling him on the phone, random, didn't know of anything, right? This poor social media, nobody was like live streaming this moment um, and said, what, what God did, God did that. What you saw, God did that. And it, it changed 
an entire movement. It, it's why we're here today. And as good as that was, and as great as that was, and we honor the past, but we're expectant that what he did then, he wants to exceed. I love that he talked about, I didn't realize that those manifestations, the people speaking in tongues, falling over, actually led to conversions. Could you imagine our church in three months? Could you imagine 1,700 people, three months? Peter talks about this same thing. These people gather, right? They hear their own language. They gather together in Acts 2. And, and Peter, the same guy who denied Jesus, the same guy who was so scared of, the, of men's opinions, of the perception of controversy that denied Jesus just days before is the same man that stands in front of this crowded group of people, confused, perplexed, as the Holy Spirit fell for the first time. And this is the same guy who begins to prophetically declare what is to come. He gives this message, it's powerful. You should read it in Acts 2. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. It's powerful. And at the end of this message, it says that 3,000 were added that day. And as we continue on in Acts, it says daily numbers were added to them. Daily New people saying yes to Jesus for the first time, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, we see this model with Jesus. Jesus waited on the Holy Spirit. He was filled and he was sent. We see this with the disciples. They waited on the Holy Spirit. They were filled. They were sent. Because this is the key. The Holy Spirit as the empower, the power is not just for you. It's important you have to have it to give it away, but it's not just for you. When the Holy Spirit comes and stirs you and shakes you and moves you and fills you, it's unto something greater. It's, it's for the sake of something else, for the sake of someone else. Remember, empower means to give someone the authority or power to do something. I love this quote from a revivalist from the 50s, Leonard Ravenhill. He wrote a book called Why Revival Tarries. And he says, dear believers, the world is not waiting for a new definition of the gospel, but for a new demonstration of the power of the gospel. John would go on uh, to talk about what this looks like, right? Those people, those young people were then sent out into the streets and those are the people praying for people and and we would call that power evangelism. And I love this definition that John writes, power evangelism is the presentation of the gospel, which is rational, can be explained, but also transcends the rational with signs and wonders and in, introduces the numinous, which just means manifest presence of God. Power evangelism is beyond being kind. We need kingdom kindness. It's important, right? Pay it forward, buy the coffee, get the growth. It's all good. It's all kingdom. But power evangelism is something different. It's being filled with the Holy Spirit's power, empowered to then go show his power to other people. That might look like a word of knowledge, knowing something you shouldn't know, right? Like, do, should, it could be a sympathy pain. Does your knee hurt right now? Do you have pain in your knee? It could look like a prophetic word. Hey, I just, I just feel like God's doing this on your life right now. Power evangelism is so important. It, it's what happens in Acts, right? 3,000. And then onward throughout the rest of church history, we see that the power of God moving in signs and wonders is the thing that would grab the attention and then lead them to the one who gave it. So important. Okay, I'm gonna be real with you. My phone, probably right now, truthfully, uh, is at a constant state of dying. 
constantly. Anybody else wake up and you're like, how is my phone dead? What? Mid, halfway through the day, it's like 10 p.m. You're like, how is my phone dead? What's going on right now? I don't know if it's my desire to like capture every second of my children's life. Like it's probably that, but also like they watch YouTube on my phone and I think they kill my phone. I'm blaming my children now. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But my favorite notification is that one around like 20% that pops up and it's like, put your phone on low power. Like, would you like to put your phone on low power mode? And I'm like, absolutely, I'm clicking yes, because I can't have my phone dying right now. I believe for many of us, we got that notification a long time ago. And we clicked that thing on. And sure, I can get by with my phone on low power mode. But to use it at its full capacity, it has to be filled. It has to be charged. It has to be on full power. I believe for some of us, there's an invitation today. An invitation to this fresh filling, to no longer be on low power mode where I can get by, like my walk with Jesus can get by. Yeah, I love Jesus. I go to church on Sunday morning and people know I, it's beyond that. It's being so filled that not only do I have to not do anything alone, that's amazing. When the Holy Spirit comes that I don't have to do a single thing alone, that's awesome, that's great. But what if he becomes so present, so real, so tangible that I cannot help, but that the atmosphere around me changes. That when I walk into my school, when I walk into my workplace, when I walk into my home, that they feel the weight, that they feel the weight of the encounters I've had with the Holy Spirit. I believe this is really important. I believe it's important, you know, all the time. But I think specifically in this time, in these coming days, I believe that there is a stirring in our city right now. I didn't always feel this way about the Midwest. I wanna be very clear. Like, I was the first one, sign me up, get me out. Like, I have an interesting view as I'm driving into Champaign every day on 74, which I learned that highway first service, you're so welcome, um, with the construction everywhere, right? You wanna talk about waiting? Construction everywhere, waiting. They're expanding our highways right now. And in the distance, I can see new apartment complexes towering over our city. They weren't there when I moved here. Like, towering over our city. I believe that our city is expanding right now. They don't even know why. Our highways are getting bigger. We've got more rooms than we've ever had before. I believe that God is gonna pour out his spirit in Champaign-Urbana like we've never seen before. And I don't say this to hype you up. I say this to ask the question, are you ready? What if he did like he did in Acts or like he did in the start of the vineyard? What if 1,700, 3,000 were added today? Are you filled? Are you stirred? Are you provoked? Do you want more? We're gonna do a call right now and I understand that we normally do worship and ministry, but I, I feel like there's an invitation today specifically for those people who clicked that notification, like you're just getting by on low power mode. You've encountered him in the past or maybe you haven't at all and you're functioning on this low power and you probably know it's you because right now you're hoping, you're praying that it's not. <laughs> Like, I don't think it's me. I don't think it's me as your heart's beating fast and you're like, I think it's me. <laughs> I want to encourage you to come down now. And I understand that it's risky and it might feel a little uncomfortable, especially those first couple people. But I believe that God is waiting right now. Yeah. 
I believe that God is waiting right now. Waiting for those who say like, I can get by like this, but I need, I need more. I don't wanna do this on my own. I don't wanna do this in my own strength. And guys, there's coming a day where we cannot do it alone. We won't be able to do it alone. There's coming a time where we will have to have the Holy Spirit move. And if you're up here right now, congratulations. You took a really risky step and God loves meeting people in a place of risk. So I want you to just go ahead and put your hands out like you'd receive a gift. Yeah, I think there's some more. We'll wait. We're not in a hurry, it's second service. <laughs> You've done this thing on your own. And as we go into a time of worship, we're gonna have kingdom kids come. So if you're over on this side, could I have you scooch just a little bit in? We're gonna have our, our kids come and we're gonna worship all together as a body of Christ. And if you're up here, I want you to just wait on the Holy Spirit. When it feels tempting to like engage and like sing, or, I want you to wait. So Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you move? Would you come change the atmosphere? Would you come fill us afresh, God? We thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving. Right now we ask you to turn it up. Jesus' name.